We have some incredible things going on with kids' ministry. It's been such a great year for us with uh, just how we do our theme days, our uh, family devotional booklets, our opportunities you know, to get together, to learn. Really, on, on Sunday mornings, um, we really value these safe environments that are also fun, where ultimately, kids learn how to follow Jesus. And we are intentional about these moments, especially on Sundays, where we know we have this you know, special 60-minute slot where we get to work with kids so that they can better know and understand who God is. And this happens because of the dedicated time from like over 100 different volunteers. Some of you are sitting here because you're gonna serve at the next gathering. And this is such an intentional moment. And I always like to throw this out there because you know, if God's been tugging on your heart about how to get involved, listen, I'm, I don't wanna say we're the best area, but we are the most fun. And so come talk to me, I'll buy you coffee or lunch. I'd love to help you get connected. We have so many ways with kids that whether it's sitting in a small circle, whether it's helping with our safety elements or our check-in elements, there's so many moments along the path, even on just a Sunday morning or outside of a Sunday, that help these kids get to that place where they get to know God better. And really what we do in creating that space over there for the kids to know God better is so that ultimately you can sit in here and have an opportunity to know God better as well. And that's what we're gonna be doing with this series, right? God being known, these attributes, these characteristics of God that are so important. And what I'm excited to talk about this morning is that this attribute we're gonna be talking about, wisdom, is something that God is not just holding to himself, but wants to share with each of us. And so we're gonna be answering four questions this morning. We're gonna be looking at who, where the source of wisdom is, who is wisdom for, what is wisdom, and how do I gain wisdom? Let's pray, and we're gonna jump in. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity this morning to dive into your word. God, that, that you did not just create and then step back and remove yourself from creation, but God, you have a desire to be a part of creation. And sometimes I don't think we truly and fully appreciate what that means. And so God, I pray that this morning that there would be a fresh revelation of who you are and what you want to do in our lives. Holy Spirit, be here. In your name, amen. Let's jump in. This morning, we are gonna be landing in Proverbs 8. So if you have your Bibles with you or you, know, you got that little di digital device in your pocket, go ahead and open up. We're gonna be sitting here and committing to Proverbs 8 this morning as we really unpack wisdom. Now, the reason for that is a little obvious. If you've read any of Proverbs, it's like wisdom literature. It's the book for it. But um, Solomon does something really unique, especially in this chapter. You see, in the first nine chapters, as Solomon was writing, he was... He was um, curating this for essentially the next generation. His hope was that younger Israelites would grab hold of wisdom. And so he was sharing that wisdom. If you know some of Solomon's story, he's like the wisest person ever because God gave him that gift. And so he is wanting to pass that along to the next generation. And so as he works through the chapters, we actually get to this point in chapter seven and eight that something unique takes place. He actually personifies certain attributes and characteristics. And in chapter seven, he personifies kind of of sin as this like female character who is this temptress and seductress who is trying to lure young Israelites and he's trying to encourage them to stay away from that. But then as he goes into chapter eight, he personifies a figure of wisdom and scholars will often reference to this as lady wisdom. And his hope here is to help the next generation better understand wisdom. And so what I wanna do is I wanna unpack this with a few different questions, and we're gonna begin towards the end of chapter eight, and we're gonna begin in verse 22 as we look at where is the source of wisdom. Verse 22 through 26 starts like this. It'll be up on the screen, and we can follow along. It says, the Lord created me as the first of his works before his acts of long ago. When it references me, it's that lady wisdom that's being talked about. I was formed at the very beginning. I was formed before the world began. Before there were any oceans, I was born. There weren't any springs of water at that time. Before the mountains were settled in place, I was born. Before there were any hills, I was born. It happened before the Lord made the earth and its fields. It was before he made the dust of the world. Jump to verse 30. I was the skilled worker at his side. I was filled with delight day after day. I was always happy to be with him. You see, there's this intriguing moment here where Solomon decides that as he's trying to convey the value of wisdom for the next generation, he wants to discuss where the source of wisdom is. And so what he does is he personifies wisdom and says that even before God began to create, he actually created wisdom. Now, I just wanna pause here for a second. This does not mean that wisdom is this like separate 
portion of God or another you know, creation, what Solomon is doing is he's trying to elaborate on this idea that wisdom is a part of God at creation. So that creation itself, all of mankind was a part of wisdom. God used wisdom, this attribute was a part of it. And so uh, Solomon's trying to convey this idea that, that God, being knowing God intimately is to also no wisdom. And so what he's doing here is he's building credibility. As he's talking about the source of wisdom, he's building credibility for his audience because here's the thing, in the nature of all of us is this desire to not look outward towards the source for wisdom, but to oftentimes look inward. And so he's combating that with how he's building this structure towards the end of Proverbs 8. And you see, this is something that we often come into contact with ourselves today. It's been actually, you know, throughout all time where we don't fully or often always look to God as the source of wisdom. We end up looking inward. I was looking this week at uh, Amazon, the top selling books, and uh, number three on the genre is self-help. Now, before I jump into this, I am not against the betterment of oneself. In fact, I think God explicitly says, like, we need to seek out our physical health and our emotional health and our mental health and our spiritual health. These are all things that God is saying that this is how we live abundant lives. And yet there is a danger in this genre because if you read certain parts of it, it will lead you to looking inward as the source for the answer rather than outward. And so you see language begin to develop of like you need to find your own truth. You need to discover your own truth and live your own truth. And what it does is it points inward to being the answer rather than looking to the source. Have you ever swam in a pond? It's disgusting. <laughs> when I was little, I didn't know any better. I was like 10 or 11, and I was with my cousins at my grandparents' place, and it was a hot summer day, and we're like, we wanna go swimming. Well, the closest thing to my grandparents' house is a pond. <laughs> And so my grandparents, I don't know, they probably grew up swimming in ponds. They didn't think anything else of it. So they're like, yeah, go swimming. So me and my cousins, we jump into the pond and it doesn't take long to like realize that this isn't right. You know, you get a little water in your mouth and like, that is not okay. Your feet kind of touch the algae at the bottom and like, this is a very different kind of swimming experience. And we were, it didn't take long and we were getting out of the water, we were done. And all of a sudden we look on each other's bodies and there are these little black slugs attached, right? Because leeches have attached. Oh, it's so, it's so gross. But here's the thing, a pond is stagnant, right? It is separated from a fresh source. And so it becomes a, a source of, it lacks, it lacks proper, like essentially for our illustration, wisdom because it doesn't get that fresh source of clean water. And in our lives, when we do that, we become limited and shallow in our wisdom. And if, eventually it becomes, it becomes toxic because we have to recognize that we need to be connected to the source. And so that's what Solomon's trying to convey. He, he's trying to build credibility for his audience and say, listen, you have to understand where the source of wisdom is because otherwise you will look internally and it will be shallow, it will be limited, and eventually it will become toxic. And so he is trying to get them to understand that. Now here's the deal, for most of us in this room, we probably believe that in a God, and so when we talk about God being the source of all wisdom, it's not like a huge revelation to you. And Solomon was looking to convey the same idea as he's building credibility because his audience for the most part is also seeing you know, God, the God of all creation, the source you know, of all wisdom. And so what he begins to work towards is our second question, this idea of like who is wisdom for? Because what Solomon begins to unpack is this idea is that the source of all wisdom is not keeping wisdom as some proprietary you know, thing to himself, but rather his desire is to share that wisdom. The creator of all things, the source of all wisdom, his desire is to share that wisdom with his creation. And so we're gonna back up a little bit at the beginning of chapter eight because here's where Solomon opens up. In verse one, he says this, doesn't wisdom call out? Doesn't understanding raise her voice on the high roads along the way? She takes her place where the paths meet. Beside the gates leading into the city, she cries out at the entrance. She says, men, I call out to you. I raise my voice to all humans. Okay, so 
Now we understand what happened in chapter seven. This characteristic of sin attributed by this woman who is you know, a temptress, she's in the shadows, she's at night, she's trying to draw individuals into secluded places. And so Solomon builds into Proverbs eight, he starts out right away and he says, where paths meet at the gates to the city, this is the public space. This is where all of the crowds would gather. And what Solomon is trying to convey is that this wisdom is for all humans. It is for all mankind. And you see, this is a fresh revelation for the people because this is something different. The idea that the God of infinite wisdom would like for his creation to share in that wisdom, well, that's something that wasn't intuitive. And here's the thing, because initially in all of us, Again, we have this innate desire to look inward or essentially to be our own gods. Because at the beginning of time, when God created mankind and, and he made us in his image, we were begotten of God, made in his likeness. The problem is, is not very long after that, we co-opted sin into that narrative. And so from that point on, we looked to become our own gods. And when we would gather knowledge and when we would gather understanding and wisdom, it would oftentimes not be so that we could share it, but so that we could hold it so that we would feel better than others. I have three boys. If you have kids, you are gonna resonate with this story. I have tried, and my wife and I, we have tried so hard to help our boys understand the value of sharing, right? It is nearly an impossible task. And I remember our middle child specifically at one point because he really cares about the things that he has. And I'm gonna be honest here, he takes better care of the things that he has than his other brothers. So there's a valid feeling for him when he doesn't wanna share. But there was this one moment when I was trying my best to be just like the best parent. And so he did not wanna share his eyes. So I pulled him aside and I said, hey bud, I would really love for you to think about sharing this with your younger brother. And he's like, I don't want to, he's gonna break it. In the back of my mind, I'm like, yeah, that's a, I mean, there's like a 50-50 chance. That's probably possible. <laughs> so I started talking to him and I said, hey, you know, you know this house that, and the room you get to live in? You know, who, who was able to pay for that and, and, and buy the house? And he's like, well, you and mom. I was like, yeah, and we want to share that with you. And I said, you know these other, you know, items that you have? You know the food that we make? Like, that's something that we prepare and, and we've bought and we want to share that with you. You know when we go places or you're doing sports and we wanna buy you, you know, the, the soccer ball and the cleats and we wanna share that with you. And in that same way mom and dad wanna share that with you, I would just love it, bud, if you would share that toy with your younger brother. What do you think, bud, you wanna share? No. <laughs> okay, I'll keep trying. <laughs> and you see that, that Thing that begins at birth, that sin that is innate within all of us continues on. And in human history, throughout that narrative, the desire to keep things for ourselves has continued. And in fact, we see it with ancient philosophers, especially the Greek philosophers would say that wisdom was only for the elite, the royal, and the highly educated. It is for the limited few, it is not for the common man. In fact, it separates the common man from these individuals that wisdom is held there. And we see this dangerously take place, especially in the first century, as the church is beginning to happen. We see Gnosticism come to arise in the early church. And so Paul and Peter specifically address it in their letters because what Gnosticism is, is these individuals who thought they were better than others, that they had special insight and discernment, that they had special knowledge and understanding. And so what they had gained, they were a little bit above Others. And so Paul and Peter specifically had a right against us and say, this is not how God intended us to operate. This is not how God intended his creation to live. The love and the grace is for all. God's wisdom is for all. And so they had to stop that out. But here's the thing. It continues forward throughout history into each of our lives. And so what happens is, is that Solomon's words thousands of years ago are still applicable today because as we worship the God, the source of wisdom, and his desire to share that wisdom with his creation, we have to grab hold of this idea that wisdom is not only being shared with us, but that encouragement to continue to share it with others. And so Solomon really hones in here at the beginning of Proverbs just saying that the God of infinite wisdom is inviting you to share in that wisdom. And so he works through that process. And how incredible it is to actually reflect on the idea that the God of all creation has a desire to share that wisdom with you. But what is wisdom? What is wisdom? 
when I was growing up, I often thought whoever won the argument was just like the wisest person. They, that, that's it, right? And yet, as we unpack and see truly what wisdom is, it's much, obviously, bigger than that. In fact, if I were to pull even just the people in this room and ask you what wisdom is, there's a good chance we'd come up with like 10 or 20 different clarifying terms. And what's funny is that Solomon does a similar thing actually here in Proverbs 8 and actually throughout Proverbs as he's dissecting wisdom and really encouraging the next generation to grab hold of it. He uses a ton of different language. He uses words like knowledge and understanding and discernment and discipline and learning and guidance and prudence. And there's, it goes on and on because Solomon's hope is that the greater amount of words he could use to clarify wisdom, hopefully his audience could kind of grab hold of it. And so what I found as I was kind of like studying for this message and looking at wisdom and, and reading from different commentators and scholars, there's two that really kind of rise above the rest. And what's interesting about these two is that you'll see them uh, built upon throughout the Proverbs and also even in your translation, I'm using the NIRV this morning, but you may have the NASV or the ESV, you know, these different translations. Sometimes even the words that I'm gonna clarify in a second get translated slightly differently in, in your language because the root word in the Hebrew really can be expounded upon in different ways. And so I, I wanna, I wanna kind of dissect this with you guys. We're gonna be looking at knowledge and understanding. And so Solomon writes here in verse five and then eight through 12. I wanna read this and look for knowledge and understanding. You who are childish, get some good sense. You who are foolish, gain understanding. I love the practicality of that. Verse eight, all the words of my mouth are honest. None of them is twisted or sinful. To those who have understanding, all my words are right. To those who have knowledge, they are true. Choose my teaching instead of silver. Choose knowledge rather than fine gold. Wisdom is worth more than rubies. Nothing you want can compare with her. I, wisdom, live together with understanding. I have knowledge and good sense. So you see two of these rising up, and you'll see them throughout the Proverbs, knowledge and understanding. And why I wanna dissect these is because of the value it has. So we're gonna begin with knowledge. So in the Hebrew, it's translated da'ath, and you'll see up there that it's a noun to know or be aware. So what this is, is this is the gathering and the retention of information, right? It's what you are learning. It's not just kind of taking something in one ear out the other, but it is knowledge that is to be gained and essentially retained. This is essentially the information that you have. This is what you know, knowledge is. And then understanding in the Hebrew is bin. And so this is a verb. You can kind of already see how this plays out. Discernment, insight, perceive with senses, skillful, act in wisdom. And so you can see the difference between the two of what's taking place. Knowledge being the information that is gained and understanding being the implementation of that. And so as we see these two at work, it, there's actually so much value as we unpack. And I, and I wanted to do this too, because um, in the Hebrew word for bin, it's mentioned uh, over 33 times in Proverbs as the root word and then expounded upon. And in verse five, which I already read, I wanted to read the literal translation. It looks like this. O naive ones, understand prudence, and O fools, understand wisdom. You see, there's this level of action here that Solomon is really encouraging the next generation to see. Because oftentimes what happens is, is we can get stuck in one or the other. We have that natural tendency. And so Solomon is addressing this with his crowd. And he's saying it's not just knowledge that is wisdom. And it's not just understanding or the action that is wisdom. But rather it's both in tandem that work together. We have to further our knowledge and further our understanding. When those two are partnered, then we truly are living in wisdom. And yet the problem and the difficulty, I know at least that I face in my life, is I often have a tendency to lean towards one or the other, and I think that I'm living in wisdom. A couple, couple years ago, uh, we were able to buy a house up in Hayden, and we were so pumped about it, you know? Buying your first house is like, 
just the coolest experience. And so as we were moving in, we realized that um, the original people who had built the house like 22 years ago loved trees. And so in the backyard, there's 10 trees that have great shade in the afternoon, but the prior owners from when we purchased it hadn't really kept on up on the maintenance. And so these trees are like 15 to 30 feet tall, and it seems like they're also like 30 feet wide. And so there was some work that had to be done. And so I was talking to my dad about it, and I was saying, yeah, I've really got to you know, trim these trees up. I'm not sure what to do. I was like, I'm not just gonna like take an ax. And he's like, oh, I've got an item for you. And so he sends me this link, and uh, as soon as I saw it, as soon as I saw it, I knew I had to have it, right? I mean, I'm just, right? Holding this just makes me feel like a better person. <laughs> I, I, I can't fully describe it. If you don't own one, this is not a product placement, but um, it's a lot of fun. So he, he sends me the link. I'm like, okay, I'm getting that. So it, 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 it arrives at my house and I, and I open up the box, right? And Here's, here's the temptation of what you do. You open the box and right on top of it is, uh, is this thing, it's this. You, some of you know what this is. If you're like me, this is still unopened. So you toss it to the side, okay? Don't judge me. And sometimes we have a tendency, we pull it out. We pull out you know, what it is we have and we are so excited. We're so excited to get this thing to use. We pull it out, we hook it up, and we just start swinging it around because, listen, I don't need to know anything else other than this is awesome, and we're gonna go to town. And we're... But the problem is, the problem is, is that if you just start using it without having any understanding of how it works, what's gonna happen? Well, you're gonna be a, a hazard, essentially. You're gonna be a danger probably to yourself and, and, and oftentimes maybe to the people around you. And how often in our faith, in our Christian walk, have we jumped in and like, you know, we heard things like, um, uh, like the, uh, when Jesus said in Matthew, you know, go into all the world, you know, making disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And like some of us just heard go and we're like, okay, that's it. We didn't hear anything else. And we have such a passion and desire to have grace and love for those around us. We've gone into the world, but we found ourselves in some really difficult circumstances. We found ourselves dealing with maybe loss and grief and we don't know how to handle it. We don't know the words to share. We want to love them and we just don't know how to really jump into that. Or we find ourselves in these difficult conversations that are surrounding maybe current political things and, and the stuff that's going on in the world and we have this desire for like love and grace and yet we don't know how to frame our beliefs because we don't know anything. We've just jumped in and we wanna use it. And there's a problem there because when we just jump in and we seek this desire for understanding without knowledge, we are not living in wisdom. But here's the other problem. So you already know which one I kind of am. <laughs> you open the box and some people, my wife's more like this, she'll get, oh, this is, this is the best part. This is the best part of all of it. And she'll open it up and she'll read through it. And all of a sudden you realize that like th when you open the box, there wasn't even a chain on the chainsaw, you know? And it's like, what idiot would just grab it and try to start using it? You realize that there's another tool to tighten the chain? Oh, how dangerous. What kind of idiot would just go use it without tightening the chain? It needs oil, it has to be set up properly because if you don't properly know how to use it, you're gonna hurt somebody. But the thing is, is that some of us, we have a desire to just live here. And in our lives, we've focused so much on the knowledge that we've never stepped out of it. And we've gone to church every week. We're so faithful. I know that we are part of church. We join a life group. We join a Bible study. We open up our Bible every morning. I have some devotionals that I love. I open them up. I feel so good about myself. And all of a sudden, I'm memorizing scripture, and I start working through, oh, love your neighbors, yourself. That's so good. In fact, I start learning all of the scripture about loving my neighbors. But when I walk out my front door, I don't know my neighbors that actually live around me. Couldn't tell you a single name. And how often in my life have I found myself in that situation where I've sought out knowledge and I think I'm living in wisdom. And yet what the Holy Spirit says is, how are you living this out? It's not wisdom. You see, knowledge and understanding have to be partnered together to be living in wisdom because one without the other is just dangerous. And it's not a value. And Solomon is trying to convince his listeners and say that you have to have knowledge and wisdom 
together. And so we find ourselves in this place. What? We find ourselves hopefully in this place where we can see in the Proverbs, we see that the God, the creator of all things, he has a desire as the source of wisdom to share that wisdom with his creation. And then we get to this point where we have a better knowledge and understanding of, of what wisdom is. Okay, I see, I see what that is. In fact, hopefully I can see like, you know, maybe where I'm lacking in that. And so what Solomon does is he leads us to the point of saying, okay, how do I gain wisdom? How do I gain wisdom? And I love in Proverbs 8, verse 17, Solomon says this. With me are riches and honor. Hold on. 17, not 18. Hey, at least I was still reading the Bible. I love those who love me. Those who look for me, find me. Those who look for me, find me. Look for me there is translated in the Hebrew as shikar. And what it means is to look early or diligently for. To look early or diligently for. I remember when I was in high school, my senior year, um, I decided to just kind of join everything I could you know, honor club and knowledge bowl and ASB and international club. And I just, I just wanted to kind of like be a part of everything. And so because of the things I was joining, I ended up having to get up earlier and I was getting up at like 5.30, 6 a.m. And this is the first point in my life and I remember this so vividly, I'd go out my door in the morning and there was a little lamp on and there's my mom sitting on the couch with her Bible open. And that is a memory burned into my brain. And as I was reading this Hebrew, this idea of to look early for, I thought about my mom, that before anyone else had been waking up, she would seek this out early, seek diligently for. Here's the thing about knowing God. He, his goal isn't to keep things a secret from us. His goal is to present them so that we can seek after them diligently. And with wisdom, there's so many other things in scripture worth looking at. A fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. A proper respect for the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. James, if any of you lacks wisdom, pray for it, ask God for it. He gives generously. And so what Solomon is saying is as you seek after this diligently, it's going to take work. I love how Dietrich Bonhoeffer kind of says this. He says, salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. You have to work for it. And even when the answers are there, it makes it so challenging. But are we willing to put in the effort and work towards that? This morning, what I felt was on my heart is to create some time for us. And before we close, what I'm gonna do is I've put some topics up on the screen. There's gonna be 14 of them. And, and what I'd love for you to do is take a look at those and prayerfully consider if any of those are things that you might be dealing with. And I've attached some scripture to it. And so you can open your Bible, open your Bible app on your phone and take a look at these. Because here's the thing, we have to commit time to gain knowledge. We have to commit time, set it aside to look at scripture and say, okay, what is this wisdom that I'm pulling from God's word for my life? And then what we're gonna do is Kyle's gonna come out and, and he's gonna just lead us in his song. And what I wanna encourage you to do for the next three minutes is as you're reading maybe one of these verses and maybe it's knowledge that you need to be gained, but maybe for you, maybe it's this idea of understanding Maybe it's this challenge of like, maybe you don't know the people that live right next door to you. Maybe understanding for you is as simple as just greeting and being a kind individual. For some of you, it's gonna be at your workplace. Maybe there's somebody that's going through a difficult time. They shared something personal with you and you're like, oh, I'm really sorry to hear about that. What would it look like for you to follow up with that individual and say, hey, how's this thing going? You had mentioned this, are you doing okay? Something I do with my Google Calendar is I will put in my Google Calendar to remember to pray for people. Because <laughs> there's so many things going on in life. 
There's so many different sports games and activities and our kids are going all over the place. I put it in my Google calendar to remember to contact someone to pray about them, pray for them. And wherever you're at, what I wanna encourage you to do with these last few minutes is prayerfully consider and seek God. God, where is it in my life? Holy Spirit, where are you guiding me to interact with others? Is it encouragement? Is it to love? Is it kindness? Do I need to be a source of joy? And after we sit with these for a few minutes, I'm just gonna come back up and close in prayer. In, in moments like this, when we set aside time to, to really prayerfully consider what God has for us and we, we ask the Holy Spirit, you know, what is it? He is diligent in reminding us of what he's called us to do. It's often in moments like this when maybe a name is placed on your heart and maybe it's a name you've been praying for but the Holy Spirit's saying, nah, now it's time to talk to him. Maybe, honestly, it's one of these scriptures for me it was one of these scriptures up here that I felt like this last week that I need to commit to memory. I need to memorize that. That is applicable for my life. Because here's the thing, information isn't life change until it's implemented. And the Holy Spirit wants to be with you as you walk this out. Let's pray. God, you are so great. And God, you are so patient with us as we continue to navigate this life, and I feel like so often I bounce back and forth between knowledge and understanding. God, I pray that you would help us be people 
that operate in both, that we would truly reflect your wisdom, God. Again, that we would be your hand extended in love with truth and grace to this community, to the people we're around, to the families we are with, the workplaces we are in. God, you have called us to be an example. And God, I pray that this attribute of wisdom that you have, that is extended to us, that we would grab hold of and live out. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.